Hello, Ambition students. I'm Andrew Fantasia. I am the acting and comedy teacher at the Ambition Performing Arts Center. And this is a quick little crash course about camera angles. You're training to be a film actor. Guess what? You're probably going to want to know what different camera angles are and how they apply to you as an actor and to the scene in general. Now, this is going to be a really quick, brief run-of-the-mill synopsis about some very, very basic camera angles. Obviously, the classes will go into much more detail, but here's just a crash course if you want to know the basics. Now, I dug through some footage of the TV show The Flash to find examples of some camera angles you all might be familiar with. Now, what better place to start than right at the beginning, chronologically speaking at least? Let's take a look at the establishing shot. This is a very basic and very practical establishing shot. It only lasts a couple of seconds, but it does a big job. It tells you where the scene is taking place and when the scene is taking place. Nine times out of 10, they're not very complicated. They're just like you see here. Just a quick shot of the outside of a building, a recognizable building, at least to the people watching the movie or TV show in question, that gives you an idea of where things are happening. Your script might say, this takes place at the police station in Central City during the day. So first you would have an exterior police station day shot, which is what we're looking at here. And then you would cut to inside the police station to carry on the rest of the scene. Now that's all well and good, but aside from a few extras walking up and down these steps, we don't really have any principal actors in this shot. So where do you, the actor, come in? Let's take a look. Here is an example of a two shot. Now, in this case, we also would have had an establishing shot first. We would have seen the movie theater these two characters are coming out of, established that this is a movie theater at night, and then pan down to our two lead characters. Now, in this two shot, we set up the simple concept of two characters walking from point A to point B as we follow them with the camera, and they exchange the lines of dialogue written in the scene. The actors are interacting with one another, but the camera is positioned in such a way that you feel like you're almost right there on the street with them. It's possible for two shots to be positioned even farther away or even closer to the actors. The distance doesn't quite matter all that much for a two shot. What matters for a two shot is that you have both of the actors showing equal parts of their head to toe body and both of them are more or less facing the camera. A lot of times though, particularly where dialogue is involved, you'll have two actors in a scene but only one of them is facing the camera at any given moment. That's where this kind of shot comes in. Meet one of your best friends as an actor, the over the shoulder shot. Why is it called over the shoulder? Can't get any simpler than this, folks. We are looking at this character, Iris. She is delivering her lines. She's holding up her phone. She's smiling. She's having a great time. But guess what? On the left side of the screen, there's our other character, Barry. We don't see Barry's face because he's not facing camera. We just see Iris over Barry's shoulder. Hence the name, over the shoulder. The majority of scenes, particularly on television, take place with over-the-shoulder dialogue, which means you and your scene partner are gonna have to get used to over-the-shoulder scenes because that is gonna happen a heck of a lot. Now, what about something like this? I know we've got some extras in the background, but primarily we are looking at our main character, Barry. Now, we have an actor here who is positioned in the frame. You don't see his whole body, though. You just kind of see from his chest upwards, and that's a very normal sort of establishing shot for a character. This is called a medium shot, which is pretty straightforward, right? You kind of see half of his body. It's a medium ranged shot. A medium shot will usually start off a scene, as is the case here. Barry has just walked into the police station that we saw earlier. We're establishing that this is Barry, this is him inside the station, and he's about to go have a conversation with another actor, at which point will get closer to their faces as the dialogue becomes a bit more personal and intense. But right now, we're just seeing that Barry is here. He's enjoying his little cup of coffee that you can just barely make out at the bottom of the screen. That's a medium shot, though. Looks pretty good, right? It also helps to establish what the character is wearing. For example, we can see here that Barry's got this whole burgundy collared shirt going on underneath his jacket. So if some action happens throughout the scene where Barry's going to be running around and maybe using a stunt double, this is a way to get the audience to sort of subliminally understand that, hey, Barry, our hero, is wearing a jacket with a maroon collared shirt underneath. And when you see a stunt double wearing the same thing, 
your brain isn't going to think, hey, that's a stunt double. He looks different. Your brain's going to think, oh, that's Barry, because that's the costume I saw him wearing in that medium establishing shot. Of course, we don't actually think that out loud. That would be weird and strange, and I wouldn't want to watch TV with anybody who says those kinds of things out loud. But this is our medium shot. It's a very common trope when you're setting up a character and a scene. Now there's the shot that every actor loves to talk about. It is the one, the only, the close-up. It's almost a cliche for actors, isn't it? Where actors are like, I can't wait for my close-up. I'm ready for my close-up. Well, this guy is ready for his close-up and he is rocking it. This is a straightforward close-up of an actor. It means you pretty much see their whole head in frame and very little else. You might get a little bit of the shoulders like we see here. You might get a little bit of the costume, the wardrobe, but mainly the close-up is all about the actor's face. And right here, it definitely shows. Remember, acting for the screen is all about getting up close and personal with people, something you don't have the luxury of doing on stage. If this guy were to make this exact same expression on stage, maybe the people in the front row might see what he's doing, but everybody else is going to be like, gee, I wonder what this actor is trying to convey. I can't see him from all the way over here in my bad seats in the balcony. But thanks to this close-up, we can see exactly what the actor is thinking. We can see the emotion he's got going on on his face that helps deliver us, the audience, deeper into the context of the scene. You can tell this guy doesn't look happy, does he? He looks like he's a bit concerned, like some bad stuff might be going down and he's thinking, hmm, I wonder how we're going to get out of this situation. A close-up is an actor's moment to shine, which means it can simultaneously be the most exciting and most nerve-wracking moment for any screen actor. If you feel nervous when it's time for you to do your close-up, it's okay. Everybody feels a little bit nervous when it gets to close-up time. But sometimes the cinematography of a particular TV show or movie can get so intense that even a close-up like this isn't quite enough to do the trick. That's when you have to venture deeper into the extreme territory, which is why I present to you here the extreme close-up. Now, this isn't from the TV show The Flash. This screenshot is taken from one of my favorite movies of all time, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. This is an image of actor Eli Wallach in an extreme close-up. And the reason the close-up is so intense and up close and personal is because this is a very intense scene. This is the climax of the movie. Everybody is pointing guns at each other. Cowboys are shooting one another. There's a big standoff in a cemetery. It's wonderful, old-timey Western goodness. And to sell how intense it is, the director needed to see the actor's eyes as big as possible. Hence, the extreme close-up, where we are so close to an actor, we can't even see their whole head in frame. Remember, when you walk into a movie theater and you watch something up on the big screen, those eyes are going to be ginormous. You are roughly this big watching a face this big do some serious, intense acting. Extreme close-ups don't happen all that often. That's why I had to go to The Good and the Bad and the Ugly because I was scrubbing through images of The Flash and I really couldn't find any extreme close-ups. They don't do it too much in television. Film directors tend to utilize this a lot more often. But as you can tell from this image, it's so intense, we can see the sweat glistening on his skin. We can see the lights reflected in his pupils. We can even see individual little imperfections in the skin of his cheeks and nose. An extreme close-up gets right up close and personal when just a regular old close-up can't quite do the trick. Now, of course, there are plenty of other different little camera angles and techniques that directors and cinematographers will use to make you, the actor, look as great as you can possibly look. But this was just a bare-bones look at some of the basics, the ones that you will most commonly find working in the television and film industry. I hope you enjoyed this video on camera angles. My name is Andrew Fantasia, and you can find out more about these kinds of things by taking one of my classes at the Ambition Performing Arts Center. I'll see you there.